I don't think oil's trading on fundamentals anymore. Um, like you look at even just the price action today, it's Monday, like goes from 72, slams down to 70, and then straight up like $4. Like that's not, has nothing to do with what's going on and it has nothing to do with the fundamentals. Um, but at the end of the day, like you can't run an economy on paper barrels. And I think uh, that's where a lot of the, kind of shenanigans going on with, is with the paper market. Um, like you look at positioning with it being like basically at all time, like it's even worse than like the whole COVID sell off, which is I think absurd to me, but, um, I think that's going to be an interesting place to look and Ben Kelleran, how are you? Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on. Definitely looking forward to uh to our, to, their, to our conversation. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And um, you've popped up from time to time. I don't know if it's been in my YouTube feed or in my Twitter feed. And uh, you had some well, your Twitter feed. You had some very insightful things to say, and not directly to me, but you're posting and that sort of thing. And then uh, I really you remind me a lot of. Uh, a guy had on uh, from New Zealand, or he, where is he at? Yeah, he's out of New Zealand. Trader Ferg. Are you familiar with Trader Ferg? Yep. I've uh, had him on the podcast, my podcast, a couple of times. Definitely uh, have some overlap with our portfolios, but very sharp guy. But uh, we, uh, I think, are interested in very similar things as far as commodities, energy, offshore oil, stuff like that. So there's definitely some overlap there. But uh, I do like to throw bombs on Twitter every once in a while. I'm sure you've seen <laughs> some of those, but. Um, I try to be a little more entertaining there, so. Yeah, well, uh, well done. <laughs> like, you remind me a lot of Trader for um, just your perspective, if you would. And that's where it, I really want to start out with. Let's actually, I'd like to chat about majority of this about oil, but let's start actually with coal. Um, I've had uh, Matt, are you familiar with Matt uh, Warder? Yep. yep. And Trader Ferg on uh, Matt a couple of times in the past six months. Um, what is your um, perspective on coal as of right now and your outlook on coal and what are you doing there? Yeah, so uh, I think it's going to be a very good place to be invested over the next three, five years, whatever you want to kind of put as your time horizon. I have been uh, trimming to buy another position. So the uh, China stimulus, my coal stocks are mocking me over the last couple of weeks, but it is what it is. It happens. Um, but I'm still very bullish. Um, I think stuff like Warrior Met Coal, um, AMR, Peabody, stuff like that, I think is going to be a pretty good place to hide out depending on what happens with, uh, broader markets. Um, I think the Aussie names are interesting. I do have questions on some of the royalty regime and, um, for a couple of those companies. Um, but I think it is interesting to see like the merger with uh console and arch. And I think we probably will get more mergers in the future, but, um, I think overall, like you look at valuations, buybacks, and or dividends. And like a couple of these companies have big projects coming online. Like I think it's going to be a pretty good place to be, uh, to park your cash for, I'd say at least two to three years. Now, when you say park your cash, so, and you did that with, um, in the context of, um, and this is an assumption, so I'm going to ask, I'm assuming you're anticipating a possible market sell-off then, um, in the near short term. Um, I think it's definitely a possibility, like valuations wise, I think they're ridiculous, but that obviously doesn't mean keep, can't keep going up. Um, I'm kind of starting to get more into the camp of, uh, the more like stimulative that, uh, like you see from the stimulation you see from the fed and you see in some of these different areas, then you're just going to get, um, that combined with the passive money flows. And that's, uh, kind of this feedback loop that is has nothing to do with valuing a company accurately, like Apple or NVIDIA or whatever company you want to look at. Like they're not worth what they're, what they're trading at. But if you look at the size of the passive flows and how much of the market is just like piled into like SPY and VU and all these index products, it's uh, like, it's kind of this self-reinforcing cycle where I wouldn't be surprised to keep, if it keeps going up, but it has nothing to do with fundamentals. So like fundamentally, like, I avoid it for, I think, good reason, but I can't say I'm bearish just because of some of the market dynamics that are going on right now. Yeah, that's well said. I've been in that camp 
for a while, if you would. It's just really hard for me to see with all the money printing. And it's not just the Fed. It's really around the world. And now you brought up China. Just the amount of money printing that's been going on, it's just hard for me to see a deflationary pressure, if you would, in the in the market. I think we are seeing it in the economy, but in the market, it's hard for me to see see a, a drastic sell-off, more than 5 to 10%. Maybe we do get it, but, you know, we'll yeah, see. I- I, th- I think it'll be interesting to watch. I think, like like you said, like the people that are talking about, oh, deflation's imminent, it's going to be the end of the world. It's like, I don't know where you're seeing that. Like you might see deflation in certain assets. Like I think parts of real estate is pretty expensive. Um, I think there's a fundamental reason that like S&P shouldn't be at all-time highs right now. But um, as far as like, if you told me, hey, you get to choose own the S&P or own like, 30 year long bonds and you have to buy it, go to sleep for five years and wake up like 10 times out of 10, I'm picking the S and P. Right. So I think the like interest rates could go down here in the next like year or two, whatever it is. But as far as like buy and hold for like long-term treasuries, I think that's uh playing with fire. So it's definitely, I think those people are going to get run over if you are trying to hold a maturity. So. Yeah. And yeah, it really leads to the question. And it's some, it's a rhetorical question. I mean, who is buying long-term treasuries? I guess the Chinese, the Japanese, but. Well, I think they're actually reducing their holdings. I'm yeah. sure they, uh, insurance companies, pensions, some of the other, um, institutions that kind of have to are buying. Um, I think governments in Europe are buying. I know, uh, Tom Longo has gone into, uh, in detail there on some of the European governments, but. As far as uh, individual investors, like I don't see like locking in, was it like 4% and change on a 10 year or TLT or whatever it is, is that appealing? So, yeah, no, totally. By the way, I had Tom on, it was about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Check out that talk. It was fantastic. I've already <laughs> listened to it. So, yeah, it was fantastic. He had it out of the park. So, let's go to oil here. And, I, I want to, I want your answer. I have my own opinion, but I want your answer on this is why is oil with everything going on in the world? And I also read the inventory reports that come out every single week and with West Texas crude or what West Texas. Um, and, um, we are, we're short and oil continues to sell off. I would love to hear what, what your thesis is on all of that. I think it's basically like I've kind of come to this conclusion more and more in recent months, but I don't think oil's trading on fundamentals anymore. Um, like you look at even just the price action today, it's Monday, like goes from 72, slams down to 70 and then straight up like $4. Like that's not, has nothing to do with what's going on and it has nothing to do with the fundamentals. Um, but at the end of the day, like you can't run an economy on paper barrels and I think, uh, that's where a lot of the kind of shenanigans going on is with the paper market. Um, like you look at positioning with it being like basically at all time, like it's even worse than like the whole COVID sell off, which is I think absurd to me, but, um, I think that's going to be an interesting place to look. And I mean, eventually that reverses, but I think you also have kind of the, uh, the trend following the commodity trading advisor type funds where it's, uh, like their whole approach is if price goes up buy, if price goes down sell. And so price has been going down for oil for a little over what, a couple of years now. And so they've been selling oil. And I think, uh, like, like you said, the fundamentals on like supply demand, like, I think we're starting to see signs of the permanence might be, might be in trouble. And I can like, I'd bet, especially if we stick around like 70, 70, like low seventies, on oil, like good luck growing the Permian in 2025. Right. And if you're not growing, you're shrinking. So, I mean, all the fundamental things are lining up and it's still just, I markets giving it away. So that's kind of my view on it. Yeah. Okay. So let's get specifically here. Or do you think this is, has to do with the election here? Uh, why we're getting, why oil is so weak in light of everything that's going on in the world? I think that's probably part of it. I know. Um, 
people talk about it being capped or at least range bound until the election. Um, I've heard a couple of people say that it's, uh, has to do with Europe and keeping a lid on inflation. Um, cause that'll, I mean, you look at inflation and how closely it tracks, I mean, with a bit of a lag, of course, how closely it tracks oil and gasoline prices and diesel. I mean, cause that basically flows through to everything in the economy, but, um, my, my kind of base case is that we'll be chopping around for a while and any rallies will kind of keep getting sold. And then sometime between now and early mid 2025, I think it starts to, uh, starts to rally pretty significantly. And eventually the trend followers are going to flip long and that's, uh, an interesting place to be. So. Yeah. No, I would, I would agree with you. And I've been, I've been one of those people, the one of those traders or investors, I should say investors that really got, got it handed to me. Um, the past, uh, I would say six months or so, I'm just very, very, I was very, very surprised, but the only thing, and again, we don't know for sure, but the only thing I can really think of is two things is we got a very important election coming up. And that's conspiratorial, I get it, but I do believe that has something to do with it. And then just as you pointed out, just trend followers, big funds, really when they're just hammering it, they just hammer something when it's down, they just hammer it. It's interesting to note too, when I see the news, it's like it all comes out of once Goldman Sachs will put out a report about being bearish oil or, um, or um, you know, any, any, it, it, it can be any news organization or big bank will become out very bearish. Well, and they, and they do it at the same time. It's almost coordinated. So I kind of get a laugh at that. Well, you, you do have that. And then you also have like the news article last week from financial times, like London will know exactly what OPEC's going to do because they're going to bring back a whole bunch of supply. It's like, okay, like what? if, it, yeah. if, if <laughs> anyone knows what is going to happen in the Permian over the next couple of years, it's the people that have been uh, pulling oil out of the ground for decades in the Middle East. And like, you look at those headlines and that that's the thing about algos. They don't like, they don't trade fundamentals. It's like, they see a headline, bam, and it's like a race, but, um, to your, to your point there, I think the other thing that's interesting too, is like the bank notes on long gold, like short oil, this and that, like, I think it's pretty interesting because even among the commodities investors or the people that are like, they can see the writing on the wall and see that commodities is going to be a good place to be over the next five, 10 years in general. Like even among that group, like you can't get people excited about oil versus like gold or the miners or some of those sectors. And like with the China stimulus, it's like basically every commodity is either ripping or grinding higher. Like you look at iron ore or like some of the industrial metals and some of these other things. And it's like basically coming out of, uh, having a big rally to say the least. And then oil is just like, nope, like down a couple percent or like stuff going on in the middle East, like, like Hezbollah's leader gets killed, like down a percent, like it just doesn't matter. Like there's no, uh no link to reality anymore in oil markets, I think. So, yeah, no, it's interesting. So that really raises the question then how, how do you see, or how are you playing this? If you would, the energy markets, how are you starting to position yourself? Is it with the equity side or are you buying futures or, or what are you doing? So my biggest position now is kind of a special situation, like deep value type deal all rolled up in one. It's called uh, Sable Offshore. And that's, uh, one I've been selling a bunch of other stuff to buy. Um, basically they have an oil field in federal waters off the coast of California. I know people are going to just automatically like ignore that right away. But I mean, it's uh, what is it? $24 stock right now. And they're basically planning to ramp production. And by the end of 20, 2025, their management's goal is to pay like a dollar per share per quarter in dividends. So that's uh, pr pretty interesting for a $24 stock. And from everything I've okay, seen, so the math that's what that's over 20%, right? Not, not quite 20%, but it's like 17, somewhere in there. Um, that's, and, it, that's great. and the thing is like, if they're paying a dollar per share per quarter, like that's, that's a stock that's not priced at, uh, not priced below 50 bucks. I don't think, um, no. and the thing that's interesting is like with that asset, like they have re uh, basically three platforms in the water and then the online or the onshore infrastructure and pipeline capacity. Um, and 
I think they're going to ramp production pretty quick. Um, and since they settled with Santa Barbara County, like the stock went from, let's see, like it was in the teens, popped up into the twenties. Now we're sitting a bit below 25, but I think it's like, they're sitting on an asset that was Exxon's best asset for decades in the U S and like, when you hear management talk about it, like what they think they can do with it. Um, I think there's a pretty interesting upside there where even if you run the math at, uh, like $70 oil and three dollars four dollars natural gas because they actually get paid for natural gas because you're they're in california um i think that comes out to some pretty interesting outcomes so it's um uh, i think a very asymmetric upside and you don't need oil to cooperate for that one to work i think it's basically near term you're going to get i think production announcement i've seen several people saying it's like first week of october which it's october 1st today so that's uh i think imminent and then They'll refinance the debt to Exxon. They'll have the uh, warrants sorted out. It's a very interesting situation, but I think more and more people are going to start to figure that out and realize like, hey, this thing's cheap at 30. It's pretty cheap at 40. And I think there's a pretty good reason to own it when like insider um, ownership between the CEO and management and institutions is like two thirds of the company. So like they stand to make billions of dollars if they execute like I think they will. So that's kind of one of my favorites. I also like, uh, offshore oil services. Um, that's been, uh, like you said, the last six months have been rough for those. Um, but I think, uh, as far as the producer side, like I haven't seen much like stable offshore that, um, really got me excited. So. Got it. So it's, you're primarily playing the equities and not like the futures markets, if you would. Correct. Yeah. I think, um, uh, like that's not my area of expertise. I wouldn't be surprised to see oil go a good chunk higher in 25 and 26. Um, but I think if you are expecting that and have some familiarity with some of these sectors, then like when you can layer that on top of like buying, say, uh, like Valeris or Noble Energy, some of the offshore drillers that are, uh, trading at like 30% of replacement cost. And if you're also kind of have that thesis that the Permian's going to roll over and some of that, like that oil has got to come from somewhere. And that's, I think in kind of offshore areas, then it looks like a pretty interesting place to be. So I think you're going to see day rates go a lot higher in coming years. I think you're going to see that the shipyards are going to be a bottleneck for building new ones. Cause I think, uh, shipyard capacity is down like 60% over the last decade. Um, and when you start to run the math on like new build cost and what day rates have to do and all these different things, it kind of lines up to be, um, like a pretty long bull market. So I think it's kind of taking the opposite side of the shale trade, but, um, I would be surprised if we're still talking about like the Permian growing in 26, like where it's like, oh, we're producing 15 million barrels or whatever. Like they say, it's like, I mean, I've seen people argue that the stats are cooked already anyways, but as far as like real production growth out of the Permian, like I'm taking the other side of that bet. So yeah, me too. I think it's rolling over as we speak. Um, but that's, again, that's just my, my thesis here. So, uh, talk to me a little bit about, um, the metals and the miners, if you would, um, what's your take on, on gold and silver, the precious metals, and do you have any positions in miners or does anything look interesting in that sector? Yeah, so I missed the boat earlier this year on the gold and silver miners. I I mean, I wrote in my kind of beginning of the year post, like I expect gold to be 2,500 by year end, which uh, was conservative, it looks like. Um, but that was kind of def a definite miss where I should have been looking at like Agnico Eagle and some of the big, it's like some of those were a layup where like Agnico in the 40s and then I mean, you can go down the list and look at some of the stuff. It's like, oh, I think I think it was a Newmont, Newmont hit, 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 hit like 29 oh. or something and it bottom <laughs> out right around there. I was like, ah, oh. but, uh, it was in March. It, yeah. But I, I think that is going to be a pretty good place to be invested in. Eventually, like the miners will get rewarded for higher, higher gold price. And I mean, I think gold keeps going higher. Like I wouldn't be surprised to see 3000 or more by the end of 25. I, I'd probably take the over on that, but, um, Silver, I think, I, I would say we're going to see all-time highs on silver by the end of 25. I think it's, I think it's going to go. Um, 
but the uh, only mining position I have in the precious metals is like a small uh, position in Impala Platinum. So that's uh, one of the platinum miners. So you have to be fine with the South Africa risk and kind of the whole government shit show down there. But it's, uh, I think platinum is going to play catch up in a big way in the next three to five years. And it's kind of more industrial, obviously, with the uh, catalytic converter use. But I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, like a big rally in platinum just because of supply and demand and kind of the current cost levels. Um, I also have a little bit of physical of the physical metals as well, kind of across all three, but, um, the only mining position I have is in Impala. So, but that's yeah. very small for the political risk. Yeah. Well, that leads me to really my next question is what's your process on evaluating risk, risk in jurisdictions, as well as company risk? What do you, what do you look for? Um, that's a good question. I think it's basically a case by case basis. Um, but I think the big. The big wins come where you kind of have a variant perspective on something. So like, I think that's where Sable is right now, for example, where like, hey, they've got a 50 to 70 year reserve life and they've got this massive asset and people just look at California oil and say, nope, no chance. And I think that's um, going to be the wrong take. But I think there's um, a lot of places in the commodity sector where like even the people that look at the U S or Canada is low risk jurisdictions. I think that's, uh, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. So I'm not saying that, uh, go out and buy the, uh, African miners and like find the best projects and do that. But, um, I think we're kind of going into a world that is, uh, very chaotic and kind of all over the place for a lot of different things. And that obviously feeds through to commodities, but you gotta have, uh, an eye on what the setup is for each company. And I think it's kind of a case by case basis thing. You got it. Okay. Anything, uh, that is besides oil that is looking, um, particularly attractive, uh, to you right now. I mean, like, and I, as, as I asked that question, I think of, uh, I don't know what your position is on uranium, but uranium had a really nice sell off from the highs and uh, yeah, well, that's what I would say, not, not setting you up for uranium, uranium specifically, but is there anything that looks attractive or that you see attractive in the next three to six months that you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think, uh, uranium is interesting. It kind of is, I mean, oil, I think it's the most political commodity, but I think uranium, it can be argued as a close second for obvious reasons as far as like nuclear weapons and whatnot. But, um, the thing about uranium that has me a little bit hesitant is, like what kind of happens with like all the, uh, the Sprott physical trust and some of these other uh, physical trusts that are based here in the West. If like a government comes in and says, Hey, like that's a uh, nice uranium you've got there. We'd like that. Um, but I mean, <laughs> they would never do that, right? <laughs> yeah. That, that would never happen. But I mean, I think like if you just kind of have organic price discovery, I think uranium is going a lot higher. Um, the miners, I'm not sure, are all that attractive. Like, I've owned a little bit of the ETF in the past. Um, as far as the set moving forward, I think, like, that sector is going to get money flows. Um, but as, like, the fundamental side, like, I'm not sure some of the miners can be... I don't know if I can say they're attractively valued here. So, um, but with that said, like, I wouldn't be surprised to see a pretty significant spike in uranium. Um, I think, uh, one of the sectors I've started to look at that is kind of interesting is, uh, like the ag sector, um, some of the fertilizers, um, some of the names in there. And this is like, I don't have much intelligence to say other than I think it's interesting. I think some of the ag commodities will be a pretty good place to be fishing over the next three to six months. Um, I think the other place that's interesting is, uh, steel. Um, that's, um, I kind of, it's interesting to see was the U S steel merger kind of in limbo right now with, uh, it being a political football, but, um, there's a couple names there that I think are interesting. If you're willing to, uh, look at outside the U S. Um, and I would say like, I'm not as excited on natural gas as I am on something like oil, but I can understand all the fundamental reasons there that natural gas will be, and some of the equities in particular will be a good place to be invested. So those are kind of on the watch list, not something that I'm uh, 
investing in currently, but I think those are going to be an interesting place to look over the next six months. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I specifically with your, uh, your eye on agriculture. And I think the way to play that is with fertilizer and the potash, um, the potash play, if you would. And there's some equities that I'm just looking at. I haven't, I haven't nibbled yet, but, um, I'm waiting just really, I'm waiting until the new year for that, just because I'm afraid, I'm a little afraid of what's going to happen short term between now and the election. I just, I think we're going to see another black swan. I don't know what it is, but I think we're going to see another black swan. So, I mean, you've got the, uh, port strike going on. That's just starting today. You've got, uh, all this other stuff. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think if we want to veer into the political a bit, I think Trump will win in a landslide if the vote's even fair, but I think it's, uh, it'll be interesting to watch the, uh, VP debate tonight. I'm curious to see how, uh, that goes, but I mean. I think a lot of people, especially after, uh, what's going on now with the hurricane there in, uh, Appalachia, like, I think there's going to be enough people in swing states that look at like the lack of government response and say, like, this is a month before the election. They're doing nothing for like our people. And we're still sending billions to Israel. We're still sending weapons to Ukraine. And it's like, if you kind of look at that, like those people in North Carolina or Tennessee, like they're not that far off from Pennsylvania or Ohio or other swing states. And I just have a hard time believing that there's going to be some mass turnout for Kamala, especially among men. Just, I I just don't see it. So that's, uh, kind of my view on the election. I think, I think Trump gets in, we'll, uh, have to see if someone takes a third run at him, but I mean, anything's kind of on the table at this point. So. Yeah, you know, it's, it is interesting. I, um, you know, Mark Faber, correct? Yep. Yep. And, uh, I had him on, it must have been about two weeks ago. And he had an interesting take that if Trump wins and he's, he's comes across as very apolitical, if he would. Um, if Trump wins, it's going to be really, really inflationary. Um, and he's not talking just because the economy is going to boom, but just because they're really going to op- they're going to print a lot more money. That's what that was his take. <laughs> yeah. the The thing is, I'm not sure how much different it's going to be if we get Kamala, which I I mean, it's basically just the current regime extended, or if we get Trump. Um, like I'm not sure how different that is for energy policy and oil prices or inflation. Like, I think like it's nice to spin narratives on some of these things, but I just don't see like, no matter who gets in office, I don't see any change for what's going on in the Permian. And I don't see many changes for like them slowing down government spending. Right. So they might spend on different things, but as far as, uh, inflation energy, like I think we're probably in like a secular inflationary period. And it seems like kind of one of those low periods right now when it might be coming out of it right now with rate cuts and China stimulus. Um, but I think it's kind of, we're at the, uh, I I would say we're early stages of commodities bull market. So that's kind of the way I'm positioned and there's going to be certain commodities go in and out of favor. Like right now, gold's in favor, obviously, but I think that's why I find it also interesting is if you can kind of find the stuff that's out of favor and kind of look at some of those opportunities at certain times, then that's where the potential for outsized returns comes. So, Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, Ben, um, if people like your work or they want, they're interested in following you, um, how do they do that? Yeah. So I have a sub stack, uh, contrarioncorner.com with uh, two Ks. Um, I also have YouTube where I post podcast interviews and stuff like that. Um, and so I'll be writing about what's in my portfolio, companies I find interesting, um, some deep dive stuff like that. Um, and then if you want me, uh, the more political, like bomb throwing side, I do that on Twitter every once in a while. So if you look up, uh, contrarian corner there with two K's as well, you'll find me there. So. Excellent. Well, Ben, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's great to uh, finally get to, uh, meet you, uh, over zoom. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on. We'll have to, uh, do it again sometime. 
I'd love to anytime. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, no problem.